You know, if you were to ever read a textbook or an article that's themed around the idea of ethical standards in counselling or psychological practice, a word that you're going to commonly come up against is the word autonomy, all right, um, or autonomous. Now, what this word means, as simplistically as possible, is our willingness as helping practitioners to respect another person's ability to govern themselves. All right, autonomous. It's about respecting another person's ability to choose wisely based upon their um, prejudices, experiences, learnings in life so far. So what this is basically saying is that as counselling psychologists, regardless whether this is the first course in counselling psychology you've ever taken or whether it's the umpteenth, doesn't make any difference, all right? What we are never going to be, regardless of how many textbooks we read, how many courses like this we take, we are never going to be the experts of other people's lives. And the reason for this is because we've never walked even one day in anyone else's shoes apart from our own. And this is, again, another really massive area that sets counselling psychology apart from the other helping disciplines. Because it's not us presenting or presenting ourselves as being the people that have all the answers but rather it's just simply us providing this platform for other people to bounce off to establish the answers and the practical next steps that they want to take for themselves. You with me? All right, so um, what I want to talk about here are the levels of relatability. All right, now you're going to hopefully be able to see relatively quickly um, how this idea ties in with what I've just mentioned there, all right, autonomous. You see, when we begin interacting or conversing with other people on a personal level or even in a professional context, it doesn't matter. What we are never going to understand or appreciate is the life's experiences that this other person has. And we've got to understand that at all times, we are all relating all things to all things all of the time. <laughs> I'll say that again. We're all of the time relating all things to all things all of the time. What's true for us is true for other people. Now, our willingness to see this is going to be based upon our ability to understand it. All right, so we've got to understand all the factors that come into play um, when it comes to us relating to the world or when we're relating the world and other people to ourselves because these are in fact the two levels or the two main levels of relatability. I mean, think about it. Have you ever felt awkward in a situation, perhaps in a social group? You might have been going for an interview. Perhaps it might have been your first day at a new job or a new school or a new university. Or perhaps you're just going out on a first date, if you can remember back that far or something like this. And if you think about what all your primary concerns are, all right, will I fit in? Will I be accepted? Will they like me? And so on and so forth. And if this is true for you, if you can at least acknowledge that, then you're hopefully going to now be able to at least acknowledge and appreciate what's going on inside of everyone else as well. You see, when it comes to um, how we show up and how it is that we relate to life, to other people, these are the factors that come into play. We've got to understand and appreciate how it is that culture impacts our relatability. You've got to understand how sometimes a set of cultural norms or cultural standards can sometimes conflict with our own, which can then send on us into a place of conflict. For example, here, uh, born and raised in Scotland, as a, as a young boy, all right, I was never a particularly avid sports person, all right? So I was never really interested in sports, never particularly passionate about sports. Um, but, but here in Scotland, Scotland is a great footballing nation. Now, when I say great footballing nation, I'm not saying we're a nation of possibly the most skilled and talented footballers, but we are possibly one of the most passionate footballing nations in the world. So um, that in mind, all right, um, throughout culture amongst young boys my age, if you weren't into football, you weren't normal, all right? You weren't one of the cool kids. So guess what happened to me in school when I showed up with two left feet, all right? Couldn't kick a ball to save myself. Didn't have any interest in kicking a ball to begin with. That's right, I ended up ostracized. Why? Because I didn't fit in with what was culturally normal. Now, 
Think about how that might have affected me later on in life as I related, you know, to myself, right? I am literally questioning when I'm going into other social groups, you know, um, am I okay? Am I good enough? Am I going to be acceptable in here? And the reason why I have this question mark over my head is because of my earlier life experience. I was ostracized and rejected. In fact, I was actually bullied back in school because I didn't fit in with what was culturally normal. All right, so we've got to understand that how well we relate to ourselves going on in life is going to be impacted by how well culture has related to us at an earlier stage in our lives. Now, what we're talking about here is our learnings, all right? Say, for example, when we're young, if we were rejected by our parents, perhaps, we perhaps might have been, um, you know, sent out of the family home, put in a, um, put in a, in, a, in, a, in a private school, our parents, we might not even know who our parents are. Can you potentially see how experiences like that in early life can, can end up having an impact on how well we relate to ourselves? If we haven't been unconditionally accepted, unconditionally loved and being treated with unconditional positive regard as children, all right, if we haven't learned how to be unconditionally accepted by others, do you not think it's going to be quite hard and difficult for us to in turn unconditionally accept ourselves? Did I mention that this course is going to offer a couple of ideas, it's really going to provoke you to look more at yourself. I could share with you a really staunch educational framework here, but this isn't about you filling your head full of knowledge, it's about you understanding yourself deeper from the inside out so that you can in turn better relate to other people, because this is what counselling's all about. So if we don't understand how it is that our history has impacted how it is that we are today, then we're never going to be able to know where to look in terms of helping other people make greater degrees of peace with their past and understand how it is that culture might have impacted the ways in which they relate to themselves. Are you with me? Does this make sense? So let's look at race, type of tribalism. Now this can kind of tie in with culture. Um, I can remember being around about 12 to 13 years old. So my mum and my dad had moved from Dundee down to Carlisle, which is north of England. Now ironically, Carlisle is around about seven or eight miles over the border in England, seven miles or eight miles away from Scotland. Can you imagine how much stick and how many names I got called as a Scottish boy growing up in the north of England? That's right, Scotty, Jockey, Hamish McTavish, every nickname under the sun was assigned on to me. And here's the thing, um, if you've ever um, experienced the Scotland England divide. It's quite a large one. Here today, in the midst of the you know 2010s, we have a bit of a polit you know political thing going on at the moment. We've got Scotland wants its independence. We have England doesn't want Scotland to break away and develop its independence because England and the UK has now chosen Brexit to separate from the European Union, which is going to have all sorts of different financial, economic implications. So you got to understand, all right? There's quite a bit of cultural, tribal hostility going on. And if we find ourselves in a culture, right, where we are the odd one out in terms of we are of a different race or of a different tribe, then we know that human beings historically um, aren't renowned for appreciating difference. Generally, what happens is most people like, whom are uneducated, rather than um, being intrigued by difference, wanting to understand difference, people reject those things that they do not understand. You are different from me, therefore you are bad. I am good, we are the superior race, and you are the inferior race, because you're not our race. Now, I'm talking um, on a grand scale here, all right? But if you think about it, this is what happens all around the world. I am but one man who's had but one set of life experiences, but I'm fully aware of what's going on in the wider world. I'm fully aware of what's happening throughout the Americas right now, even in various Australasian countries. And um, people of certain ethnic um, groupings are, you know, <laughs> being treated absolutely dismally. Um, because of their religious beliefs, because of their cultural beliefs, their cultural religious practices, 
and so on and so forth. And all I really want to emphasise here is how, as a human race, we are so intolerant. Um, when people come into our midst that are different from us, nine times out of ten, more people, more often than not, will reject people for difference rather than approach them with intrigue of understanding. All right? There's an age-old proverb all right, written in the ancient texts, um, seek first understanding before all other things. Seek first understanding before all other things. But people don't do this. Most people don't anyway. Most people reject those things they don't understand, all right, assuming that they do understand. Or perhaps what they might have done is generalised an individual because of a set of experiences that they've had with someone else of a similar race or a similar tribe or from a similar cultural background. When it comes to language, think about how our use of language can either build people up or tear people down. Many people think that language is all about what we say, but I'm going to suggest that it most certainly is not the case. Going back, I think it was to the 1950s or the 60s, there was a gentleman named Mr. Albert Meridian, and he came up with this framework called the Meridian Model. And what he said, what he suggested, was that our, um, our communications are kind of broken down into three main parts. We have our, our, our words, we have our tonality, then we have our, um, phil- uh, our, 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 our physiology. All right? So say, for example, as you're watching this course right now, you're watching this video, you could be judging me for any number of reasons. You might be um, judging me, you might be perhaps rejecting me right now because I've got a Scottish accent. You might not like the shirt that I'm wearing. You might think that my diagrams are particularly poor. You might be rejecting me and this course because of some prejudices that you have. Well, here's the thing. The prejudices that you have and your expectations are not my responsibility. And what's true between us is true for absolutely everyone else as well. Going back to this Moravian model, when it comes to our communications, many people don't understand that it's not uh, very, very seldom what we say in any given context, in any given conversation, has the greatest impact. What we say, our words, generally make up around about 8% of our communications. But our tonality actually makes up around about 34%. So our tonality being how we say what we say. Think about it, right? Just as you're watching this video right now, if I was to remove tone, tonality, variance in tone from my communication and I was to talk really rigidly and not move, remove all physiology, all emphasis out of my words, you might be thinking, my goodness, Kane, this is starting to sound pretty boring. All right? Well, if we think about how counselling psychologists have historically been judged, all right, think about um, any TV shows or movies that you've watched. What happens? All right, how is counselling generally conveyed? You'll have a lady or a man who'll be sitting there in a chair on a really monotone language, saying, "So tell me, and how do you feel? Let's let's talk about your relationship." with your mum and dad. And I just want to literally burst any bubbles here, just in case you have any, that just because we want to become counselling psychologists does not mean that we have to become really monotone and really boring. Why? Because communication is not just so much about what we say, but it is in fact heavily impacted and influenced by how we say what we say, our tonality. But then our physiology comes into play as well. How we convey and conduct ourselves, how, how open we are in our physiology is going to paint a picture um, and, and help another person appreciate whether we're the kind of person who's open for them or not. All right, you might be aware that I get a little bit um, energetic sometimes when I'm teaching a message, or especially if I'm talking about something that I'm, that I'm passionate about. And if you think about how it is that you communicate a message, think about the quality of the relationships that you have in your life right now. All right, Think about how it is that your words, your tonality, your physiology impact how it is that you and your message might be being received by other people. Now, um, you might be thinking, okay, what's this got to do with anything here? Well, our language and how we say what we say, our words, when backed up with our physiology, is going to be determined by how it is that our culture and our race has deemed 
um, normal, if, if, if that makes sense, cultural expectations and cultural norms. So in Scotland, it's generally not okay to be positive, right? We are in fact one of possibly the most negative breeds of people in the world. Right, if you walk through the town centre and you're, you know, whistling as you whistling as you go, you're gonna get some funny looks. People are gonna look down on you. They're gonna be smoking their cigarettes, spitting on the floor, cursing and swearing. That's generally culturally accepted as normal. Being positive, all right, um, encouraging people to look beyond the problems and you know pursue their dreams and the goals and their ambitions in life is deemed as wishy washy, Americanized positive thinking is hippie garbage nonsense, all right? Now, if that was the case, if I'd bought into those cultural beliefs, I most certainly would not be standing here presenting this course today. So you've got to understand that sometimes we really need to fight through our cultures to become more effective at just being who we are. And it's only when we become more effective at being who we are do we present ourselves in such a way that's going to be more readily accepted by other people. Why? Because we're tearing down the impact that culture's had on us. We're ridding ourselves of ourselves. Now I mentioned that a few videos ago and here I'm starting to illustrate what I mean by this. 